Hello, and welcome to this Instructor T4T webinar to prepare you to teach CORE for social workers in California. This T4T provides a general overview of basic child welfare assessment procedures, best practices, and the structured decision-making system integrated throughout CORE classes. As a core instructor, it is important that you have a basic understanding of key foundational assessment practices used in child welfare in California, including, including standardized structured decision making, or SDM, assessment tools. This course will take approximately one hour to complete. Core for Social Workers is designed to provide a standardized training program for all new social workers in the state of California. CORE version 3.0 will be fully implemented in February of 2017. This webinar provides the state required training in the area of assessment procedures and structured decision making. The state also requires training in the areas of cultural humility and trauma-informed practice. Both of these trainings are also available as recorded webinars. Additionally, there is a facilitation skills T4T classroom training which focuses on shifting the role of instructor from stand and deliver to facilitator in the classroom. These trainings are required to be completed within the first year of starting training in core classes. The purpose of this webinar is to provide a general overview of best practices for assessing and partnering with families and their support networks, as well as an overview of structured decision making, also referred to as SDM. Please note that this is only a brief overview of SDM and some of the basic concepts that you should be aware of so that you can successfully integrate SDM into the classroom throughout CORE. We certainly don't expect you to be an expert on SDM after viewing this webinar. It is strongly encouraged that you attend additional SDM training to gain a deeper understanding of each tool. Let's take a moment to briefly review the learning objectives for this course. Upon completion of this webinar, you will be able to K1, identify the structured decision-making assessment tools and safety organized practice tools used in California. K2, recognize and discuss the importance of assessment and engagement practices and how it is woven throughout Common Core 3.0. K3, Identify how components of structured decision-making tools, family engagement, and trauma-informed practice are complementary to one another. The values learning objectives, V1, value using a holistic child welfare practice framework centered around strong family engagement principles and understanding of the impact of trauma and grounded in evidence-based practices, V2, value assessment as an ongoing collaborative process with families and their support networks and family teams in engaging, assessing, case planning, monitoring and adapting, and transitions. V3, value a rigorous assessment process that considers the family's strengths, protective factors or capacities, and safety needs in the effort to achieve child and youth safety. Let's review some key concepts for instructors. The safety organized practice model, also referred to as SOP, is a collaborative practice approach used in several California counties. The practice model emphasizes the importance of teamwork and aims to build and strengthen partnerships with the child welfare agency and within a family by involving their informal support networks of friends and family members. SOP uses strategies and techniques that align with the belief that a child and his or her family are the central focus and that the partnership between the agency and the family exists in an effort to find solutions that ensure safety, permanency, and well-being for children. It is important to note that SOP is not formally called out or referred to in Common Core 3.0 curriculum. There are several collaborative best practices that are often associated with SOP, such as safety mapping, teaming, and other engagement strategies that are in integrated throughout core curricula and are not referred to as SOP. They are referred to as best practices in child welfare. As a trainer, as a trainer 
for CORE, you will not be talking about SOP directly, as it is not referred to in the curricula. All of the tools and strategies traditionally associated with SOP should be referred to as best practices in child welfare. If you have any further questions about uh, using SOP versus um, referring to best practices, please ask your uh, regional training academy. Let's review some best practices in child welfare. These best practice approaches have been found to be vital to engaging with families in a respectful and ethical way and are integrated throughout core classes. Instructors should have a strong foundational knowledge of these best practices in child welfare in order to support social workers in the classroom so they have the tools they need for success in the field. These best practices will be further defined later on in this webinar. These are the objectives of using best practices in child welfare. Engagement, creating positive working relationships and a shared focus to guide casework among all stakeholders. Critical thinking, helping these stakeholders consider complicated and ambiguous case information together and, support, and sort it into meaningful child welfare categories. And enhancing safety. Clearing the way for stakeholders to engage in rigorous, sustainable, and on-the-ground child safety efforts. These are recurring, th recurring themes throughout Common Core and should be lifted up by instructors in the classroom whenever possible. This is a brief list of where the best practices can be found in Common Core 3.0 classes. These classes are um, divided into each block. Foundation block, engagement block, assessment block, case planning and service delivery block, monitoring and adapting block, and transition block. These are just some of the classes uh, that cover these best practices. Now let's review some best practice definitions. Cultural humility. Cultural humility involves a humble approach to working with families and demonstrating a belief that families are the experts of their unique qualities and characteristics. This is a key component of building strong relationships with families using a non-judgmental, open-minded, and humble approach and treating families as experts about their own lives. Please refer to the core Cultural Humility t for t recorded webinar for additional information. Trauma-informed practice involves an awareness of trauma and its impact on behavior and quality of life in the lives of children and adults. This practice involves a recognition of and empathy for the pervasiveness of trauma and seeks to understand the connection between presenting behaviors, thoughts, attitudes, and or coping strategies. Additionally, it is crucial to understand the impact of trauma that may be created by being involved with child welfare and learn ways to acknowledge and try to reduce this impact. Please refer to the core trauma-informed practice t for t recorded webinar for additional information on this topic. Teaming, engagement, and collaborative practices involve a collaborative team approach and encourages the building of shared language, understanding, and engagement with families to assist and empower them to build their own supportive network and safety plans. Teaming is essential to effective engagement with the family and their support network to ensure a successful working relationship and better outcomes for the child and family. Teaming may include working with families to build a supportive team, Engaging the team in planning and decision making with and in support of the child, youth, young adult, and family. Working with the team to address the changing needs of the family. Working collaboratively with community partners to create better ways for children, youth, young adults, and families 
to access services. Benefits of teaming include providing a structured process to gather and organize information to move toward joint understanding and agreement between the family, organization, and within the organization itself. It can be used with the family to guide a conversation, develop goals, and can be used in supervision and case consultation. Relationships are the most significant factor in promoting child safety, permanency, and well-being. The words we use matter, building a, a series of shared agreements over time to reach larger goals requires that we share some common language. The more the information is effectively organized among all the key people involved, the more likely it is that effective decisions can be made. And this is at the heart of teaming practices. Ways that instructors can highlight this in the classroom is by encouraging social workers to work with the family to use teaming practices whenever possible. This can be formal or informal. It's also important to remind social workers that, it, um, that learning facilitation skills is important in their day-to-day -day work, as they will be facilitating informal and formal meetings, including monthly visits, check-ins with parents, caregivers, service providers, and support networks, home visits, office visits, and supervised visits. And they'll also be conducting more formal meetings, such as case consultation with their supervisor, um, facilitating family team meetings, child and family team meetings, multidisciplinary teams, independent living program meetings, and court hearings. Facilitation skills are important to develop and are transferable in all areas of social work. And it's important to note that family team meeting facilitation is integrated throughout core curricula. And there are several activities around teaming and uh, facilitating meetings. Uh, students should also be reminded that structured decision-making tools should be discussed in these meetings as well, particularly the safety and risk tools, as well as uh, family strengths and needs assessment tools. Discussions about safety should occur with the family versus to the family. The information from these SDM tools should occur as discussion and dialogue with the family in these types of meetings. Safety mapping is a collaborative assessment and planning process of gathering and organizing information to re reach joint understanding and agreement with the family and their support no network and within the child welfare agency. This process can be used at many points in casework, including but not limited to individual supervision and case consultation, group supervision, family team meetings, and at the kitchen table with the family. Um, instructors can encourage social workers in the classroom to use mapping as a collaborative safety planning tool throughout the life of the case. This is helpful to use as a way to organize information, build shared understanding understanding with families and encouraging consistent com uh, communication and documentation. This is an example of a safety mapping tool used in several core class activities. It is similar to the three column map that many of you may be familiar with and incorporates the three questions. What is working well for the family? What are we worried about that directly impacts the child? and what needs to happen next and by who. This is a tool for gathering and organizing information. It is important to note there are many other tools and ways to gather and organize information so it is clear and understandable within the agency and for families and their support networks. This is just one example of a tool that can be used. Instructors can remind social workers in the classroom that there are many ways to organize this information. The important part is that they are familiar with these types of questions that they can ask to gather information, and that they have a tool or strategy in their practice to organize the information in a way that allows for transparency and shared understanding with the family about the strengths, worries, and next steps to achieve the safety goals. It is essential that social workers understand the importance of identifying and engaging the family support network in order to develop safety plans that are sustainable with clear roles and responsibilities in order to support the family after their child welfare case is closed. When should this occur? This should occur throughout our work with the family. 
at initial safety plan during child welfare investigations, during ongoing cases, such as family reunification and family maintenance, and with transition case planning while preparing for case closure. Some support network tools utilized in core classes include family safety circles, genograms, and ecomaps. Additionally, there are a wide variety of safety planning tools and templates used in various activities throughout CORE, both in the classroom and as part of field activities. Instructors can highlight this in the classroom by reminding social workers of the importance of working with the support network to develop safety plans with the family. If there is no support network identified, there is no safety plan. Also, reminding social workers of things to consider when developing safety plans with a parent. Does the parent or caregiver have the ability to access resources to provide necessary safety interventions? Does the parent or caregiver have supportive relationships with one or more people who are willing to participate in the safety planning? And is the caregiver willing and able to accept their assistance? Is there at least one parent or caregiver in the home willing and able to take action to protect the child, including asking the offender care, offending caregiver to leave? Is the caregiver willing to accept temporary interventions offered by the worker and or community agencies? These are just some things to consider when safety planning. The safety circle tool, like genograms and ecomaps, is a way to help workers and families begin to identify members of the support network. This tool is developed by Susie Essex and Sonia Parker. Conversations about the support network will occur throughout CORE, and you will see this tool used in a variety of classes as a practical tool to use with children, youth, families, and young adults to have a conversation about their perception of who is in their support network. It also helps families visually see who is in their network and who they may be willing to bring into um, safety planning meetings, family team meetings, and what roles they may play. This is a dynamic process and is supported by inquiry and questions such as, who from the middle circle would you want to move into your inner circle and why? What would tell you someone in your life was ready to move to the inner circle? If I said you had to move someone to that inner circle for us to take the next step in this case, who would you pick? Instructors can remind students in the classroom that it is not only important to identify the support people, but using a tool such as the safety circle can help workers get away from some of their biases and really gain some quality information from the child, youth, young adult, or family about who they consider to be a part of their support network and the roles they may play. Just like the safety mapping tool, this tool helps social workers organize information to help them make next steps such as inviting the network to the table, making placement decisions, and so forth. Instructors can connect this to mapping and teaming activities by reminding workers of the importance of always including the network in the conversations around case plan development, as well as monitoring and adapting the case plan with the family. Safety planning is at the heart of child welfare services and is a key focal point throughout core classes. We always want to be monitoring and adapting the case plan with the family as their needs change throughout the life of their child welfare services case. Teaming activities should be utilized as often as possible when developing safety plans. Safety plans should be created as part of a team and revisited throughout the life of the case with the family and their support network. It is important to note there are different terms used for safety planning throughout CORE. Examples include short-term safety plans used during a child welfare investigation to ensure the child can safely remain in their home with support. Then, the family's case plan may also include objectives and services to address any safety issues in the home and includes the overall safety goal for the family. The case plan is different from the um, short-term safety plan, but includes behavioral be indicators that are measurable in order to determine whether the parents can ensure safety for the children over time. Aftercare plans or transition case plan updates 
our safety plan for the family and their support networks to ensure they have adequate support once their case is closed. A 90-day transition plan for youth is a, is a safety plan created with youth to ensure they have adequate support from their network before they transition out of care. A strength-based approach is key to conducting a balanced assessment with families. In the past, child welfare traditionally looked at the things that were not working with the family. This approach focuses on identifying and building on strengths, capacities, and resources within the family system that could be used to ensure safety and well-being of the children. Strengths may include past and current efforts in protecting children from harm, maintaining loving parent-child relationships, assessing extended family and other support systems, and making efforts to address past and current stress conditions, including drug use, family violence, mental health issues, unemployment, and so forth. Instructors can highlight this in the classroom by reminding workers of the importance of a balanced assessment and how using solution-focused inquiry and a strength-based approach can help them gather rich and detailed information about the history of protection and the history of the problem as well as gathering information needed for SDM assessments, while staying focused on the impact of the caregiver's actions or inactions on the child. They can also remind workers that this approach encourages families to become part of the decision-making process and acknowledges their strengths and resources. Social workers can utilize this approach in the use of solution-focused questions, motivational interviewing, use of what's working well, to focus on family strengths, and the completion of the SDM Family Strengths and Needs Assessment Tool. A solution-focused approach involves collaborating with the family to identify their ideas of solutions that will work to ensure safety, permanency, and well-being of their child or children. This approach encourages families to become part of the decision-making process and their strengths and resources are acknowledged. Solution-focused inquiry is part of this approach. It was developed by Stephen Deschazer and Insu Kimberg in the 1980s and 90s and includes a set of different types of questions that can be used with families. Types of solution-focused interview questions include the three questions, what's working well, what are we worried about, and what needs to happen next, Exception questions, scaling, miracle, coping, and preferred future questions. This approach also includes the use of appreciative inquiry, which is the opposite of problem solving and it seeks to instill hope in families by focusing on what is going right and well in their lives. What we pay attention to grows, and by paying attention to what's working instead of and solely on what's not working, social workers can contribute to positive change in individual groups and organizations. Appreciative inquiry involves a collaborative exploration into the best of people, their relationships, and the world around them. Ways this can be highlighted in the classroom. As an instructor, you may see many teachable moments and opportunities to utilize some of these types of questions as you are facilitating discussions in the classroom, such as reminding workers of specific solution-focused questions they may use with families to utilize appreciative inquiry, find exceptions, explore preferred future, and so forth. Please refer to the handouts, assessment questions, and solution-focused questions included with this course to help familiarize yourself with the types of questions that you can use in the classroom to encourage social workers to use these types of questions with families they are working with. Consider how you may be able to ask some of these questions when workers have questions in the classroom. This is a shift from the instructor providing the answer to the instructor being a facilitator in the classroom and encouraging more of a critical thinking learning process, helping students come up with their own answers. In thinking about doing a rigorous balanced assessment, there are three basic questions to help guide us in our work. What are we worried about? what's working well, and what needs to happen next. Every interview and every stage in the life of a child welfare case needs to cover these three main issues, whether it is at initial referral screening, emergency response, 
family reunification, family maintenance, permanency planning, and our adoption services. These are considered solution-focused questions that can help social workers gather and organize the information they need to engage families in an effective way. Instructors can um, remind social workers in the classroom that the details of how they ask these questions and what content will, um, that they focus on will change, but these are the three most central questions. They are valuable at every stage in the life of a child welfare case, from screening to adoption. These can also serve as a way of preparing the caregivers, family members, collaterals, and even the children for the interview. When we tell them, I'm going to be asking you a lot of questions, but they all boil down to these three. We help prepare the interviewee for what we are looking for. It starts us off on the right foot for collaboration and better helps them prepare to participate. We may not always think about it, but the conversations we have with children can really help ensure we get the most out of our STM tools. Remember, the STM tools are only as good as the information we get. Children can help enhance and verify our information. Instructors can highlight this in the classroom by reminding social workers that families and children are the experts on themselves, and we cannot define the problem better than the family as they are the ones that can tell us what is happening and this information informs our assessment. Remind social workers in the classroom to engage ch the children in any age-appropriate teaming activities. And they can also bring the child's voice into the room at all family team meetings and other teaming activities as appropriate. This can be accomplished with the use of various child interviewing tools such as the free houses and safety house tools. The Three Houses tool was developed by Nikki Weld and Maggie Greening, two child protection workers in New Zealand, as they searched for ways to do assessment and planning. This tool is not specifically referred to in CORE. However, it may be mentioned as a tool that social workers can use to engage children during child interviews. So three questions um, are corresponding to the three houses. So if you think of the house of good things as what's working well, we um, can think of House of Worries as what we're worried about, and the House of Hopes and Dreams is what needs to happen next. Instructors can remind social workers in the classroom of this tool when you are discussing child interviewing and bringing the child's voice into the room during family team meetings, case consultation meetings, and so forth. Three Houses is exceptionally good for learning about risk, danger, and safety from the child's perspective. So you will see that it also has value in beginning safety planning. The safety house is also used as a method of including the child's voice in safety planning. The safety house interview begins by asking the child a solution-focused miracle question. Miracle questions are some of the most well-known questions from solution-focused inquiry. This one goes like this. This is your house, but it is your house if you always feel safe. All the reasons for working with you, all the things that worried you or scared you, have been taken care of. Instructors can remind social workers that this tool can be used when uh, interviewing a child, when safety planning with children, and also brings the child's voice into the room during family team meetings and case consultation meetings. So now let's move to the structured decision-making system. The structured decision-making system was designed to identify the key decisions in child welfare practice and then create evidence-based assessment tools that can help make those decisions accurately and consistency, consistently across even large counties and states. The SDM system is set up to bring the best of research to the important decisions of child welfare. SDM was developed by Children's Research Center, or CRC, in the mid-1980s. It is now used in the United States, Canada, Australia, and Bermuda. The SDM system is focused on key decision points and helps us to be intentional about decisions. It's easy to drift through decisions, especially those regarding case closing. The SDM system emphasizes the importance of clear, concise decision points. SDM assessments support decision making. They do not make decisions. Assessments do not make decisions, workers do. While the decisions are structured, 
No magic formula tells you what to do. The SDM assessments fit together, each with a different purpose. It is important to understand the function of each assessment and how they fit together. Each assessment serves only one purpose, and it is important to know the purpose in order to get the best out of each one. The goals of the SDM system include reducing subsequent harm to children and facilitating timely and expeditious achievement of permanency, including reunification, whenever it is safe to do so. To accomplish these goals, the SDM system has some core objectives. SDM system looks at the critical decision points in the life of a family's involvement with child welfare and has a tool that is relevant to each. SDM assessments help us to be more consistent or reliable in how we make decisions. In other words, when multiple people use the same assessment with the same family, they will get the same results. Consistency helps promote equity in decision making and helps make sure that families receive the support they need, regardless of what social worker is assigned to their file. SDM assessments will help to support greater accuracy or validity in decision making, particularly related to identifying with which families are more likely to experience harm in the future. SDM is referred to throughout all core blocks and classes. However, these classes listed have activities that utilize specific SDM tools, as you can see in each practice block on the screen. It is important to note that the SDM manual will be a standard tool on the tables in all core classes and should be referred to often as instructors make connections between SDM and key concepts being covered in the classroom. Referring to the SDM definitions for each tool may be particularly helpful during class discussions about safety and risk. This slide is a reminder that SDM does not replace clinical skills. Thorough assessments depend upon good interview and observation skills. Rather than replacing clinical judgment, SDM becomes a strong partner, providing a research basis for critical decisions related to risk and structure for increasing consistency and accuracy of other key decisions. Instructors can highlight this in the classroom by reminding workers that SDM tools are not used alone to make decisions. A well-balanced assessment includes the use of structured research and evidence-based tools, as well as the worker's own information gathering and research about the family engagement with the family and their support networks, consultation with their supervisor, and their own clinical judgment. The SDM policy manual main contains all of the information necessary to complete all of the assessment tools. Within each section, you will find the tool itself, definitions, and the policy and procedure with explicit instructions on how to complete the tool. Instructors should familiarize themselves with the SDM Policy and Procedure Manual. The majority of core classes include activities that will ask students to refer to their SDM manuals. It is very important for instructors to remind trainees to double-check the definitions to ensure that they are completing the SDM tools correctly. Instructors should be familiar with the definitions and or know how to find them, so they will be prepared to facilitate discussions about SDM in the classroom. Additionally, please refer to the handout, Assessment and SDM Instructor Resources, included in this course, for the link to the SDM training website that can provide you with additional information about SDM and how to utilize the tool. Here are some tips for using definitions in the SDM model. First, read to the period means read the entire stem of the definition. One common mistake is taking a phrase or a piece of a definition and then applying the definition inappropriately. Second, as in the definition of historical information, when you see a big and, it means that the circumstances stated on both sides of the and must be true in order for the definition to apply. When you see a big or, it means one or the other circumstance must be true in order for the definition to apply. Third, 
Remember that information that has not been asked about is different from information that is unknown. If information is unknown, the definitions should be applied in a manner that is focused on child safety. Fourth, the purpose of examples in the definitions is to offer an illustration about the threshold, nature, severity, and so forth of what is intended by the definition. If an example fits your situation, it does not mean the whole definition applies. Conversely, if your situation is not specifically listed in the definition, it does not mean the definition does not apply. Finally, use your professional judgment and common sense. For example, if the definition says that the child must be 10 years old, then if the child is a few days or weeks shy of 10 years old, they are substantially 10. The terms needs, risk, and safety threat are often used interchangeably in child protection. However, when using the SDM system, each of these terms has an important, distinct meaning. It is important that instructors have a good understanding of these definitions so they can facilitate discussion about the safety threat, risk, and needs of the family. First, a safety threat is about the short term. When we talk about danger in the context of the SDM system, we are looking for serious and imminent threats to a child. Serious means the harm would require medical or mental health attention or emergency services. If the social worker does not think the threat can be contained, he or she would not leave the child in the home. Imminent means the social worker reasonably expects that harm will occur in the next week or month. The SDM system defines safety as protective actions taken by the caregiver that mitigate danger and are demonstrated over time. A social worker's understanding of a family's safety may change as he or she learns more about a family. In the SDM system, social workers assess safety when they first meet a family and then they assess it again whenever their understanding of the family's safety changes. Whenever a social worker is considering whether a child should be removed from the home, a new safety assessment should be completed. Risk is about the long term. Instead of serious and imminent harm, we are asking about probability that any child maltreatment will occur in the next one to two years. That may sound like we are trying to predict the future, but we are really trying to assess the odds using a research-based actuarial assessment to help us. Needs are also about underlying conditions in the home which may contribute to safety threats or risk factors, or may be utterly irrelevant. When considering strengths and needs, we are talking about the family's capacity to provide for the child's ongoing safety and well-being. These terms in the SDM system are related to the prioritization of information. We start with danger and the safety assessment in order to learn whether there is a problem we need to address right now. Then we take a little more time to consider risk and the risk assessment because risk is further in the future. Needs and the family strengths and needs assessment are at the very end of our list because they help us decide what to do to address any safety threats or risk factors we may have identified. Here are the SDM tools at a glance. The next section will provide a basic overview of each tool. This is a visual that highlights how the SDM system provides an assessment for each key decision point in the lifespan of a perfect protection file, which is divided into three parts, intake and response, investigation, and ongoing. For all referrals requiring an in-person investigation, they must meet statutory trans threshold for an in-person response for screening tool. It is very important to be familiar with the definitions of all of the abuse types. When a referral is received, the hotline worker determines whether or not to conduct an in-person investigation. The hotline screening tool is designed to assist the worker in making this decision. When further investigation is warranted, the response priority tool helps determine how to quickly to respond. If child welfare agencies have unlimited resources, they could respond immediately to every call. Instead, we must decide which 
requires an immediate response and which can be investigated within 10 days. Some counties also use differential response tools to guide decisions as to whether a situation requires the expertise of their agency staff or whether a community agency could adequately meet the needs of the family. The SDM safety assessment tool is completed during the course of a child welfare investigation and helps answer the question, can the child safely remain at home with or without a safety plan? Safety assessment components include the following, child vulnerabilities, safety threats, caregiver complicating factors, household strengths and protective actions, in-home protective interventions, and placement interventions, if applicable. This is a visual reminder of how SDM is linked to everyday social work practice. This is an example of how workers can use the safety mapping process to gather necessary information for the SDM safety assessment tool during their initial investigations. Instructors can remind social workers in the classroom that SDM should be part of an ongoing discussion in family team meetings and safety mapping meetings with the family. These teaming and engagement activities can help build shared understanding about what needs to happen next. Before we move on, let's review the shared definition of safety. It is essential for in instructors to have an understanding of the definition of safety to effectively communicate this to social workers in the classroom, as this is the focal point in our work with families. It is important to highlight the definition of safety throughout core classes to ensure that trainees have a shared understanding of what safety means. The substitute care provider safety assessment is to be used for all investigations of abuse or neglect of a foster child by a substitute care provider. As instructors, it is important to be aware that some social workers may think that SDM does not apply to them and they don't have to have a working knowledge of how to complete the tools. It is important to continue to highlight for social workers that even adoption workers will need to have a basic understanding of the SDM tools especially this tool, as it applies to adoptive homes if the adoption has not yet been finalized. Additionally, workers often change positions throughout their careers and will likely need to know how to complete the SDM tools at all stages of their work, including the hotline tool, which can help workers understand how decisions are made when a child welfare referral is first received. The risk assessment tool identifies families with low, moderate, high, or very high probabilities of future abuse or neglect. The risk assessment is, is based on research on cases with substantiated abuse or neglect that examine the relationship between family characteristics and the outcomes of subsequent substantiated abuse and neglect. This tool is completed during the course of an initial child welfare investigation. This slide shows the relationship between the safety and risk assessment tools. It's just a reminder that the safety assessment helps us determine what we are worried about, while the risk assessment informs us how worried we should be. The Family Strength and Needs Assessment Tool, or the FSNA, helps workers identify the strengths and needs of the family to inform the development of effective, relevant, and culturally appropriate interventions. This tool requ requires the gathering of information from all family members, collateral, and a review of records and should be completed with the family whenever possible. It may be completed or modified during the course of family team meetings. The family should be engaged in culturally appropriate ways to ensure an accurate assessment. This tool should be updated a minimum of every six months and whenever there are significant changes in family circumstances. This tool helps inform case plan objectives and services and is most effective when completed before each case plan up update. 
to inform any changes to strengths and or needs of the family that should be considered during case plan development. The reunification reassessment tool helps to guide decision making to help the worker decide whether to return a home or return a child to the removal household or to another household with a legal right to placement, to maintain out of home placement, and or to terminate reunification services and implement a permanency alternative. The reunification assessment reassessment is completed in conjunction with each appropriate household and begins when a case is first opened. The risk reassessment tool determines whether the case should remain open or be closed. For cases that will remain open, the reassessment includes updating the treatment plan based on current needs and strengths and sets new contact guideline levels. This tool should be completed a minimum of every six months for all in-home cases. Let's review the key points. The SDM model consists of tools and not forms. Use of the assessments, not only because we have to, but to help guide decisions. The SDM model guides decisions, but workers make decisions. Read the definitions. Coordinate your narrative with the SDM assessment. Working together, the SDM model can achieve reduced harm to children. The SDM model is part of a larger practice framework of decision-making and family engagement. The tools are simply a prompt for practice. When all is said and done, the single biggest predictor of positive outcomes in child welfare according to a study by Farmer and Owen, is not the services or the interventions. It is the relationships we build. Those other things are important, but without good working relationships between social workers and the children and families they serve, everything else gets more, much more difficult. In addition, building relationships with the support network, including family members and other collaterals, is also important and helps support the child's safety and well-being. When we talk about relationships, we are talking about making sure families understand what is going on, giving them choices, being transparent, saying what we mean, and doing what we say we will do. When we start with this assumption that relationships are key, it causes a shift in how we need to think about assessment. Please refer to the following handouts for additional information assessment and SDM instructor resources, child welfare best practice definitions, SDM tools and assessment tips, solution focused questions, and assessment questions. Thank you for viewing this webinar and for your dedication to core training for new social workers in child welfare. If you have any questions or would like additional information about CORE for Social Workers, please contact your regional training academy. Please refer to the Assessment and SDM Instructor Resources handout for links to each regional training academy.